Hope you're trying to have a productive day. In this video, we will go over one more past paper question. This question will be question number two from the 2010 unit one paper two. Let's get right into it. First part of the question, draw rays to show the passage of white light through figure two, a diffraction grating, figure three, a triangular glass prism, and figure four, a rectangular glass block. Let's get into that one right now. The first medium that light was passing through, or the first thing that the light was passing through was a diffraction grating. So let me just draw a quick diffraction grating. This represents our diffraction grating. Now when light passes through a diffraction grating, it diffracts. Now what is diffraction? Diffraction is the spreading out of a wave as it passes through an opening. Now the diffraction grating has these little holes on it right? This is one, this is one, that's one, that's one. There's a dog barking in the background. <sighs> anyway, ignore the dog and just listen to what I say. Maybe the dog wants to learn physics too. All right. So basically what happens is that when the size of this hole is equal to or less than the wavelength of the wave that is passing through the hole, the wave will undergo diffraction, which means it will spread out. So light coming in like this like that will spread out with one going here one going down here and you will have some arrows in between these two now if this is white light the spreading out is going to cause you to see different colors of light because white light is a combination of all the colors in the visible spectrum so this color up here would be red light and this color down here would be violet. Why is this red and this violet? Why is it not random? Why is violet not at the top? Well, I'll explain that briefly. Basically what happens is that, remember when I said at the beginning that the fraction occurs when the wavelength is larger than the opening or when the opening is smaller than the wavelength? Well, red light has a higher wavelength than violet. So the comparison of size to the wavelength of red light compared to the opening is different from the comparison of size of violet's wavelength compared to the opening, right? It's the same opening, but these two have different wavelengths. Therefore, red is going to be diffracted more because the comparison of its wavelength to the size of the opening is larger. It's much larger than the opening, whereas violet is not as large as red in terms of its wavelength, so it gets diffracted less. And then the other colors would be in between the red and the violet. Now, the same kind of diffraction would happen in this hole, in this hole, and in this hole. So let's say light ray goes there. You would still have the red and the violet. But in the center hole, you wouldn't necessarily see diffraction of white light. What would happen in the center hole is that you would see one line and it would be white. Now, why is this white? This is going to be white because all of the waves that meet at this point are in phase. They're in phase because they leave here in phase, so they arrive here in phase. So the phase difference is going to be a whole number times lambda, right? So they're basically in phase. And because all the waves are in phase, they all interfere constructively. And basically, they give you one white light. That's the diffraction grating. Let us move on to the second object that the light passes through. The second object that the white light is supposed to pass through is a prism. Now, when the white light passes through a prism, it's going to cause the light to be dispersed, right? Similar to a diffraction grating. So let us draw the normal, and the normal is a line that is perpendicular to the, the surface, or the boundary in this case. So this would be perpendicular. It makes a 90 degree angle with the surface, like that. So that's our normal, right? So it would make a 90 degree angle like this. Now let us draw our incident ray. Our incident ray is going to come about here and then it's going to meet the boundary, right? 
Now, when light or waves are traveling from a less optically dense medium, which in this case would be outside of the prism, because outside of the prism is air, and they're traveling to a more optically dense medium, which is inside the prism, then the refracted ray bends towards the normal. It would bend towards the normal, like this. Now it reaches another boundary, but in this instance, it's going from a more optically dense medium, which is inside the prism, to a less optically dense medium, which is the air outside the prism. And in that case, let's redraw a normal. So this is a second normal, and the wave is going to bend away from the normal. Since it's moving from a more optically dense to a less optically dense, the light is going to bend away from the normal, like this. Now this is what would happen if you just had a monochromatic light source, but the question asked for white light specifically. So because it's white light, what actually happens in white light is that there's some dispersal that takes place when the light refracts. So that one line would be, let's say red light, and then this second line represents violet light. Now the second line is going to have Yet again, another normal. And then similar to the first one, it's going to bend away from the normal. So this is the normal. Don't pay attention to this line here. This line is just an emergent ray. This is the line you need to pay attention to, the broken line, the second broken line here, that's the normal. So it's going to bend away from the normal, which would be about here. So let's call this red light and this violet light, All right? Now, if you measure the angle between the emergent ray and the undeviated original ray, then you will notice something. So this is going to be the original ray going in its original path like that. And the angle between the emergent ray and that original ray is here, this angle here. For the red, and then for violet, it's actually a bigger angle here. Now, what happens is that the red and violet actually have different angles of deviation. And that difference in angle of deviation is what causes the colors to basically separate when they come out of the prism. So because they come out at an angle, you basically see that the light separates. And it comes out at an angle here, which is different from the angle down here, because again, the wavelength of the light. Red light has a larger wavelength than violet light, as we said before, which means when red light is traveling through this medium, it's going to move faster through it. And because it's moving faster through the medium, it gets refracted less because it's spending less time in the medium. Therefore, the angular deviation that it makes is also less. Violet is slower. So violet takes more time in the medium, it gets refracted more, and then it, its angle of deviation is larger. That's why you see the different colors. It's due to the difference in the angle of deviation. So this is what would happen if white light passes through a prism. And, and similarly to here, where we have the red and the violet, and you have the colors in between, you would have colors in between the red and the violet. So you would have another line that goes here, has its own normal, comes out, another line that comes out, yada, yada, yada. But I only drew two here for the sake of simplicity. You probably don't have to draw more than two on an exam, but I drew two here for simplicity's sake, and to make the diagram not look too cluttered. Now let's go into the last object that the light passes through. Now this object here is a rectangular glass. So now we're going to draw the normal again. Remember perpendicular to the surface. So this is the normal. And now let's draw the incident ray. The incident ray is going to arrive there. And remember, from a less optically dense medium to a more optically dense medium, it bends towards the normal. So it's going to bend like that, towards the normal. And by towards the normal, instead of going in this direction, or instead of going, instead of bending like that out there, it bends like this, towards the normal. That's what I mean by towards the normal or away from the normal. So now we're going to have this refracted ray 
and it's going to emerge from the glass block. And when it emerges, it's going to undergo refraction again. And this time it's going to bend away from the normal. So it moves like that, roughly, right? So this is the path that white light takes through the glass block. And in this instance, there is no separation apparent. And that is because the colors will emerge parallel to each other, unlike here, where they came out at an angle to each other. And then we can move on. So that is that question over. Let's move on to question number two. The graph on page nine shows the relationship between the signs of the angle of incidence, theta one, and the angle of refraction, theta two, for monochromatic yellow light traveling from glass to air. Use the graph to find the missing values of theta one and theta two, and then insert them into the table below. So basically, we don't have to plot the graph. The graph is already plotted. The graph is already plotted. Here it is. They did it for us. So all we have to do is fill in these empty spaces. Now, the table is going to give us values of theta 1, gives us some theta 2, and we're supposed to fill out the rest. Now, it says use the graph. So if we look on the graph, we can find some values. But notice on the graph, this is sine theta 1. It's not theta 1, it's sine theta 1. And over here on the y-axis, it's sine theta 2, not theta 2. So basically, the graph gives us the sine. So the graph gives us the values here and the values here. We are going to have to use those values and do a calculation to find theta 2 and theta 1, respectively. What calculation will we do? Well, we'll do them when we get there. Let me just make up a table real quick. All right, then, this is what my table looks like. Now, let's put in the values that they gave us. Now, these are the values that we are given. And we're supposed to use the graph to fill out the rest of the table. So for the first part, it gives us theta 1, and then it wants us to write something here. In this column, we go sine theta 1. All we have to do is find the sine of theta 1, which in this case is sine of 31. When you work out sine of 31, you get 0 0.52. Now we need to find theta 2 and sine theta 2. Now, sine theta 2, we will get from the graph. So let's find sine theta 2 right now. So all you have to do to find sine theta 2 for a corresponding value of sine theta 1 is basically look on the graph on the x-axis in this case, because that's where the sine theta 1 is. You're going to look on the graph for the value that you are given, which in this case is 0 0.52. So it would be about here, this right here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this right here is where 0 0.52 would be for sine theta 1. So now that you have that on the x-axis, all you do is you move straight up. You go all the way up until you touch the uh, plot. Then you're going to read the value of the y-axis. So you go across. So first you go straight up, touch the graph, then at that point you go across, right? And that's how you will find the sine theta 2 value when you are given the sine theta 1 value. If you are given sine theta 2 and you want to find sine theta 1, you do the same thing, but in reverse. You go all the way across and then you touch the graph and then read all the way down to find the sine theta 1 value. So let me just go ahead and populate this next data point. So from the graph, sine theta 2, when sine theta 1 is 0.52, sine theta 2 is indeed 0.75. Now we need to find, now we need to find theta 2. How would we find theta 2 when we're given sine theta 2? Well, you have to do a mathematical operation called sine inverse. So basically on your calculator, you're going to press shift and then you're going to press the sine function and that will give you sine inverse. Sine inverse looks like this. It's sine to the minus 1. That's sine inverse. So when you type up sine inverse, you simply put in the value. So sine inverse of 0.75. And then you will get a value of roughly 48.6. So that's how you fill out the table. So you would go and read off the values and then do the sine inverse to get the theta 1 values over there. So I'm just going to go ahead and populate the graph. So for here, I would have to find sine of 75.2. That would be 0 0.97. And then I would have to find the sine theta 1 value that corresponds to 0.97. And when I read that from the graph, I would get 0 0.67. Then I have to find the sine inverse of 0 0.67, and that gives me 
42.1. And you would do the same thing down here. Now, sine theta 2 would be sine of 90. The sine of 90 is actually 1. You don't have to calculate that. Once you don't remember that, you don't have to calculate it. Why is the sine of 91? Well, if you draw a right angle triangle, like this, and you find sine, sine will be opposite over hypotenuse. Now, sine of 90 is this here, so the opposite side to this angle is this side. So it would be the hypotenuse. And sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, so what is the hypotenuse? Well, the hypotenuse is still just the hypotenuse. So you get the hypotenuse over hypotenuse, and that basically equals 1, which is why sine of 90 is 1. So now you read off the sine theta 1 value from the 1, and that's actually at the top of the graph, and you will get a value of 0 0.69, and then you find the sine inverse of 0 0.69 to give you 43.6. Now we have come to a point in the video where I would recommend you probably can take a break, and if you want to take a break earlier on, you can take a break when you're doing these past paper questions. You don't want to burn yourself out, you want to retain the knowledge or try to do something that retains the knowledge, so you can take a break, drink some water, walk around for like five minutes and then come back if you feel like you can't watch all of the video all in one. Moving on, state the value of the critical angle of the glass. Now, what would that be? The critical angle is the angle of incidence that yields a refracted ray whose angle of refraction is 90 degrees. Let me just represent that diagrammatically. Let's say you have that. It's a boundary. This is more optically dense. This is less optically dense. Let's draw a normal. Now, in order for this phenomenon that I'm going to explain to work, the ray has to be traveling from a more optically dense. So let me write that. This part of the boundary is more optically dense, mod. And this side of the boundary is less optically dense. Right? In order for the phenomenon that I'm going to explain to work, you have to be going from a more optically dense to a less optically dense, right? So basically what happens is that this is the incident ray. It's going to go like that. Now, when the incident ray comes at this intersection, it's going to bend away from the normal. In other words, it's going to bend in this direction. When this angle is increased like this, when this angle moves up like that, and the angle here gets larger, what happens is that the incident ray moves even further away from the normal. It goes even closer. Now what will happen is that eventually you'll get to a point where instead of the ray going like this or like that, the ray actually lies perfectly parallel to the, the boundary, if that makes sense. And when that happens, the angle of refraction is indeed 90. And that angle of refraction, when it is 90, is related to what is called the critical angle. So the critical angle is the angle here, the angle of incidence, that basically gives you an angle of 90 for the angle of the refracted ray, right? So in other words, when the refracted ray is like that, which is here, and the angle of the refracted ray is 90, this angle here is indeed the critical angle. So when the question is asking for the critical angle, it's asking for the angle of incidence, which is theta 1, which gives an angle of refraction of 90. So if we look here, we can see that when theta 1 is 43.6, theta 2 is 90, which means that this angle here, 43.6, is indeed the critical angle of the glass. The question then says, state what happens when the angle of incidence is 55 degrees. Now, if in this diagram, the angle was increased until the refracted ray became uh, perpendicular to the normal, or became parallel to the boundary, if this angle goes up even further, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that the refracted ray no longer really refracts, and instead, it's reflected internally. In other words, this, this ray here moves down, and you get this. And this right here is a phenomenon called total internal reflection. 
right? So when the critical angle is surpassed, the phenomenon you get is total internal reflection. In that instance, there will be no refracted ray. Instead, you will get a reflected ray inside. Now, the last part of the quest, use the gradient of the graph to determine the refractive index of the glass for this color of light. What is the refractive index of the glass for this color of light? Well, you could figure that out using this formula here, where one over sine C is equal to the refractive index. But the question said, use the graph. So we're not gonna use this approach. But if you are given the critical angle, which is what C is, you could do sine of the critical angle, divide one by that number, and then you would get the refractive index, right? But the question says use the graph, so we'll use the graph. But how exactly will we use the graph? Well, the graph will give us a gradient, and the gradient is going to give us a quantity. What quantity will the gradient give us? Well, let's use one of Snell's laws. N1 sine theta one is indeed equal to N2 times sine of theta two, right? Now in this instance, what is N1, what's theta one, what's N2, what's theta two? Well, N1 is the refractive index of the glass and theta one is the angle of incidence. N2 is the refractive index of the air and theta two is the angle of refraction, right? So that's what those values are. Now, the refractive index of air is essentially one, which means N, N2 times sine theta two is the same as saying just sine theta two. So to find N1, which is the refractive index of the glass, we need to divide this side by sine theta one and then divide this side by sine theta one and we'll get the refractive index of the glass. Now, on the graph, you can see that the y-axis has sine theta two and the x-axis has sine theta one. That basically means all we have to do is find a gradient of this graph and the gradient is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And we will find n1 according to this here. Let us do that right now to find n1. So you can use any two points, but like I said, for a gradient, you might wanna use a big triangle. The points I will use will be y2 equals 0 0.9, so that's y2. And then what is, or what is the x value that corresponds to 0 0.9? You can read it all the way down, you go all the way down and you will realize that it is actually 0 0.62. So y2 is 0 0.9 and x2 is 0 0.62. Now we need to find y1 and x1. y1, let's say we can take it as 0 0.21, so up here, this right here, so the x value that corresponds to that would be basically 0 0.15. So our y1 is 0 0.21 and our x1 is 0 0.15. So all we have to do is complete this operation and it will give us the refractive index of the, of the glass. So this basically is going to be equal to 1.4. Seven, And that right there is the refractive index of the glass. So with that, we have completed the question. If we did all of this working out in the allotted time frame, then we would have acquired 15 marks. So thank you all for watching and I hope you've learned something.